Let's get this week started. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. Features doing okay. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Live from New York, we begin with the big issue. It's a monster week for markets. The big week. We've got earnings season. It is big tech earnings coming through. Big tech earnings. We have uh, the Fed meeting. Chairman Powell. A lot of data coming up. Second quarter GDP. We've got the Michigan survey the week ahead. One of the most important weeks in the market. It's really about the outlooks. Apart from the earnings, I think we'll then find another data point. Growth, the persistence of inflation. You have the same headwinds we've had for most of the year. I think it's going to be difficult all summer. It's difficult enough right now. Joining us is Morgan Stanley's Michael Kushmer and Miletti of All Spring Global Investments. And let's begin with you. This Wednesday, if we get 75 from this Fed, is that the final 75 basis point hike of this cycle? No, I don't think it is. I think um, the Fed is determined to do more to prove that they have inflation under control. Um, so I think the market anticipates more than 75, but they certainly only anticipate 75 this one this week. Michael Kushmer, are you at 75 this meeting and 75 again? Uh, uh, certainly 75 this meeting seems, uh, you know, baked in, baked in the cake. And the next meeting will depending slightly on the inflation over the next couple of months. Up till now, inflation data has been disappointing. There's been no real signs of inflation uh, ameliorating such that if we don't get that uh, downshift, the month on month numbers don't start downshifting to 0 0.5, 0 0.4, I think we'll get 75 uh, in September, but I think 50, 75, it's, it's skewed to 75, but it's possible we get 50 if we get some relief on inflation. Well, and let's talk about the road to September. The meeting is on September 21. On August 10th, September 13th, we get CPI prints. August 5th, September 2nd, we get payrolls prints. It is, the, is it the labor market that allows them to do more or inflation that forces them to? You know, I think it's going to be a combination of both, Jonathan. I do think the numbers are going to start to trend down. Um, hopefully, we saw the peak inflation number. I'm never going to put bet on that. Um, but I think we probably have, given what we're seeing with energy prices and other things. And so market looks like to, to be anticipating that as well. If we see that we're seeing jobless claims also increase, which tends to lead um, what we see in the unemployment rate, so the data is showing a slowing in the economy. That's why you've seen this 8% rally since June. The market is, you know, counterintuitive in some ways. It looks like we're getting what the market needed from the Fed. The real slowdown is happening with the rate increase. Michael, Ann mentioned it. Three weeks of jobless claims climbing. It's not just jobless claims, it's the PMI as well coming in some 50 on the services side. Really, really weak stuff. We see the weakness in housing. We've seen people start to pull back on job openings. Michael, a question I've asked a few times over the last few weeks, how much of that is desirable from the Fed's perspective and how much of it is undesirable? Well, I think that the, the slowdown in hiring you know, has to happen. We're downshifted from last year to this year, you know, 500,000 plus last year to 300,000 plus this year. But from what I understand, you know, equilibrium stable unemployment is down around 100,000 a month. That's just for stable employment, a stable unemployment rate. So that has to keep downshifting in order to get that relief on, on wage front medium term if we're going to get back to anywhere near that 2% inflation target over the medium, medium term. So I think that downshift has to happen. What you don't want to see happen is that jobless claims numbers go to like 300, 300,000. We don't want to see that anytime soon. Futures right now up a third of 1%, about 25 minutes away from the up and bell on the S&P. We are higher on the Nasdaq. We're up a third of 1% also. Mike McKee will be in that news conference, as he often is. He joins us right now. Morning, Mike. Good morning, John. Take a look at the calendar going forward. Everybody's focused on this Fed meeting on Wednesday. But I'm going to argue that Thursday and Friday are going to be even more important for the markets. 
and here's why. Uh, the Fed is going to do 75. The Wall Street Journal didn't come out today with any different prediction, and that's the way the market's set up going into it. But what about after that? Jay Powell is going to be very circumspect about what he says going forward because we don't have an answer to the question of are we in or going into recession, and we don't have an answer to is inflation slowing. They're somewhere in the middle. So at this point, uh, we're going to be watching that data to see if that makes a difference to the Fed, if Jay Powell says we aren't sure yet we're open to whatever, then the market's going to have to decide. A lot of people leading towards this recession question. There's no definition called a technical recession, and the NBER numbers <laughs> don't suggest it at all. You take a look at the left-hand side of this chart of the measures that the NBER uses, and you can see a recession. Take a look at the right-hand side. You don't see a recession in that yet. Uh, we haven't seen a big fall off. So we've got to look at the data to see where we're going to end up. Now, the markets are at this point thinking that we're going to see a 50 basis point move for the last uh, meeting in sep for the meeting at the end of September. But that could change easily as the data change. So let's check on Friday, especially with the ECI wage price spiral. Uh, spending and, uh, and, and wages still going up, and the uh, PCE numbers show us inflation or not. There's an awful lot going on uh, in the markets that they're going to have to pay attention to, and I think that's why it's going to be more important than actually what the Fed decides. We know what they're probably going to do. Mike McKee, we've got a flavour of this over the weekend from Secretary Yellen. You're suggesting that we might be spending Thursday morning potentially di disagreeing over what is and what is not a recession. I suspect that'll be the case on Wall Street because there are people who are convinced that we are in recession. Yep. Two quarters in a row, we may get uh, declines, uh, contractions. But then there are others who think not yet because of the data I just showed. So it's going to be an interesting debate going forward. And we get to do it all through August. That's the great Can't thing. Can't wait. It's Until so Jay fun, Powell Mike. speaks at Jackson Hole. Mike McKee, thank you. Looking forward to the Jackson Hole coverage alongside you as well. On Thursday, when we get that GTP print, we're not expecting a negative print. The median forecast is not looking for that in our survey, but a few banks are individually. Bank of America, TD, Deutsche Bank, Nomura, all looking for a second straight quarter of negative growth. Michael Cushman back with us. Michael, can you tell me how you think the market might respond to that? Well, I think that the, the market is expecting weak economic data. It wouldn't be surprised at all if we got a negative print. And of course, it's very difficult as you get close to zero or around zero. A lot of these sort of uh, Volatile numbers like inventories, trade data, which is very difficult to forecast, becomes a key factor whether you're minus 0.5 or plus 0.5. And what I really focus on is domestic demand. Now, how is domestic demand moving? Is incomes rising, incomes falling? Can, that will support the economy medium term. But whether it's minus 0.3 or plus 0.3, I think is relatively moot. Are we already seeing the recession trade? And can I ask that of you? Given what's happened at the moment with this rotation we're seeing away from the inflation trade, cross-asset, we've seen that develop over the last month or so. Do you think we're starting to price that a little bit more? I think, I think we're starting to, to price... Oh, that was Fran Maletti. Sorry. Go on, out. Sorry. I'm so sorry. Um, I think we started to price more of a normalization of growth. Um, certainly probably a shallow recession leading us to normalization, um, but not in any way a deep recession or a global recession, Jonathan. So um, we, we need to get to normalize growth. And that's what makes this all so confusing. Um, even when you look at the long-term data, we had outsized growth for a long period of time due to COVID. And you know, no one really knows what normalized looks like anymore. So if you get a little bit of a shallow recession that leads us back into some normalized growth, that actually could be healthy. And I think that's what the market is trying to settle on. So I think we're going to be stuck in a trading range while, while we figure this out. It's trying to draw a distinction between pricing slower growth and pricing a recession. It depends where you look. If you look to the commodity market and the drawdown we've seen there, maybe you can make the case that we're starting to price that. If you look to credit, Michael Kushmer, I would say typically in recessions, you don't get about 100 basis points of spread, spread tightening in a single month. And Michael Kushmer, that's what we've had. What are your thoughts on that? It was quite, quite, quite impressive. I think it really comes down to the thinking that yields have peaked, 
Fed policy terminal rates have peaked, if not come down. We're talking about three and a half, three and three quarters just a month ago in, in June when the Fed moved 75 basis points. That's come way down. Expectations that the break even inflation rates are coming down will be back at target by the end of 2023. A lot of good news has come in to support the idea that we won't have to have a big recession. The, the, the slowdown we're seeing will, will be enough to generate um, a stable Fed funds rate or cuts in Fed funds rate in the first half of next year, which is bullish for um, riskier assets. So, Michael, let me put you on the spot. I caught up with Marilyn Watson of BlackRock, Mike Collins of PGM, and George Borey of All Springs on Friday, late Friday afternoon, and I asked all three of them whether they thought we'd seen the high on the 10-year yield for this year, potentially for this cycle. All three of them said yes. Then I asked them whether we'd seen the wides of the year on credit spreads on high yield. All three of them said no. Where do you stand on those two questions? I think there is a high probability we've seen the high in 10-year Treasuries this year that we peaked at that week in, December, in, January, in June when we, the, the Fed surprised everyone by raising rates 75 base points. We got to you know, 360, something like that. I think that even if the market thinks Fed funds is going to four, that's going to be, lead to a bigger recession, which will cap long-term bond yields, at least for now, until we know the true trajectory of inflation medium, medium term, which we won't know until the end of the year or early early next year at the earliest. In terms of credit spreads, um, you know, when we, we got to a high yield bond yields, you know, over 8% on the in, on indexes, that looked pretty recessionary like, not catastrophic recession, not like global financial crisis recession levels, but a more normal cyclical recession, 8% seems pretty high. So I'm, I'm hopeful that actually we may have seen the highs in, in credit spreads um, this cycle. Interesting. Michael Kushmer of Morgan Stanley and Maletti of Allspring will be sticking with us. Let's get you some moves ahead of the opening bell about 20 minutes away. We can do that with Kelly Lines this morning. Hey, Kelly. Hey, John. Well, let's kick it off with Apple because we got news overnight that if you live in China, you could get a discount on an iPhone coming up this weekend. Four days of discounts on that iPhone Pro 13 model, Jan uh, July 29th through August 1st. They're really trying to spur demand as they deal with COVID uh, zero policy there, which is also affecting them on the supply side with a closed loop system now going into place for Foxconn in Shenzhen. That stock is essentially unchanged right now in early hours. You also have Intel up about uh, half of 1% or so, securing a contract to make chips for Taiwan's MediaTek. That's a step forward in their efforts to compete with the likes of TSMC or Samsung in that foundry business. We also have yields moving pretty substantially higher today, up eight basis points on the 10-year. That's giving a lift to some of the banks like Bank of America, up about one percentage points. We'll, of course, keep that sector in focus ahead of that Fed decision and after it on Wednesday. And finally, on the note of China, I would note we had uh, reports overnight that they are looking at a fund to support some of those developers in crisis, that lifting iron ore prices, and as a result, boosting the idea that steel demand may, may be stronger. So U.S. steel getting a nice, nice lift before the opening bell, John. Kelly, thank you. We'll catch up with you again before the opening bell as well. Got some pushback against the Secretary Yellen narrative about whether it would be, would not be a recession. Someone just wrote to me, a Bloomberg subscriber, the fact that Secretary Yellen is trying to manage the narrative on recession is probably a good indicator that the second quarter number will be negative. That's one person's view. I know you'll have more as well. Morgan Stanley's Mike Wilson just said this on the equity market rally we've seen over the last couple of weeks. He published over the weekend, of course. He said, with equity markets seemingly shrugging off bad news on the economy and earnings, it may be trying to get ahead of the eventual pause by the Fed. This is the punchline for Mike Wilson. The problem this time is that the pause is likely to come too late. Mike Wilson and Morgan Stanley there. Peter Cheer, I know, of Academy, has got some thoughts on this. We'll catch up with him at about 9.30 Eastern time around the opening bell. Coming up, it's a big week for big tech. Technology is a great way to sort of play that slowing growth theme. The consumer is going to stay resilient, but things aren't going to be all roses and sunshine. I think technology is an area you really do want to look at very hard. Apple results are in the spotlight. That conversation up next. A difficult spot for Apple. Our concerns are one part is services and another part is China exposure. Never ending COVID zero is a difficult backdrop for durability of uh, consumer demand in China, which is an important end market, and the stability of production. Apple doing something you don't usually hear about, announcing a rare discount for top-tier iPhones for customers 
in China. This coming as China forces major companies, including iPhone manufacturer Foxconn, to operate under a restricted system in Shenzhen to curb the city's latest COVID outbreak. On top of the story, back with us, here's Kaylee. Well, John, Foxconn is one of about, of about 100 companies in Shenzhen forced into a closed loop system for a week. That includes the likes of BYD and Huawei, DJI as well. And it really speaks to how COVID zero impacts Apple on both the supply and demand side. On the supply side, obviously, when you have the majority of the world's iPhones being made by Foxconn, that can impact production. On the demand side, the shuttering of the economy leading to a broader slowdown, which could, in theory, weigh on sales in the Chinese market. So Apple, as you say, trying to make a move to counter that announcing a rare promotion in China four days of discounts from July 29th to August 1st about $89 coming off the price of the iPhone 13 Pro and certain AirPod and Apple Watch models as well but as you say an interesting move for a company that usually is reluctant to offer any kind of discounted pricing so why take that step in China well we have to consider it's a very important market for Apple makes up about 20 percent of its revenue but interestingly when you take China together with the other international markets in which Apple operates that's the bulk of its revenue U.S. revenue only is about 42 percent of the share. And that overseas exposure also means the company is exposed to serious foreign exchange headwinds with the dollar hovering around its strongest level in about two decades. So I expect we'll be hearing about that when the company reports on Thursday and probably from the other big tech companies reporting throughout the week as well, John. Kelly, thank you. Anne Meletti, I wanted to come straight to you on some of this and get your thoughts. I understand you might not be able to comment on the stock specifically, but when you heard that, that a company like Apple was offering discounts in China on top-tier iPhones, not the cheaper ones, the top-tier iPhone, what did you think? Well, you know, Jonathan, I think there's a couple of things. You know, on Apple specifically, we know that the launch of their new phone also typically happens in the fall. And so, um, and, and when after the launch, they typically give discounts. So maybe it's not that crazy for them to offer discounts a little bit ahead of that, um, given all of the things that Kaylee just mentioned, right? Um, the lock-in, the demand, pull-in, et cetera, in China because of the unique factors, also the dollar. Um, so, but the, the, real, the real challenge that we're gonna have to continue to watch across the board for all companies is what they're saying about demand. Um, it's been a supply issue that we've all been focused on, and now it's a demand issue. And you know, look, earnings have been great. Top line up 10% so far. Earnings up five, but that's not what investors are focused on. They're focused on what management teams are saying about future demand. And do you expect to get a decent read on that from the five big tech names that report this week that make up about 20% of the S&P and 40% of the Nasdaq 100? I think it could be mixed, Jonathan. Um, and I do think the dollar is going to play a role in terms of profitability. Michael Kushman, I want to bring up the FX side of it because this story is so important to people in the equity market too. What's the base case for you, Michael, on the foreign exchange side of things? Uh, the base case is that we've, we've reached a, um, a not to say a peak in the dollar, but it's going to be increasingly difficult for the dollar to continue to rise. You know, it could have fall, rise a bit more, but it's really about um, Europe in, in that sense and the China slowdowns. Right now, we're having a synchronized sort of problem around the world. The U.S. economy is slowing significantly. The European economy has slowed significantly. And China is not getting that, that post-COVID relaxation of, of, of restrictions boom because they're continuing to pursue the zero COVID strategy. So there's no sort of engine of growth for the world. And in fact, when you look at a place like Japan, and while a couple of months ago, while the Bank of Japan has to give up their zero interest rate policy, they have to tighten policy like everyone else, they, they didn't do it. The yen gets you know, crushed, one of the weaker currencies in the world. But now looking forward, as the, as the global economy is decelerating, maybe the Bank of Japan doesn't look so out of step that actually keeping rates steady and not tightening policy may serve them well in the weeks and months ahead. Michael Kushner, so are you that suggesting that Operation Ostrich over at the BOJ might actually be a good idea, just to bury your hand and ignore everything going on around you? Well, if, if you keep something in place long enough, right, the clock goes around twice and eventually it becomes the right strategy again because the cycle turns. And I'm not saying that for sure, but it doesn't look quite as bad from a market perspective, um, consensus view, than we did a little while ago where were people were talking about the Fed as now tightening so much we're going to get a recession in the U.S. and we may not get as much of a slowdown in Japan and maybe the yen has, has bottomed in the high, you know, 130s. Michael Kushman, you broad, mentioned broad. China. I want to bring up China too. There's a big situation evolving there with this loan boycott, so-called loan boycott spreading. There are other people who are raising the question that maybe we've got a balance sheet recession on our hands 
in China. We're not used to a China spitting out 3% GDP growth. Michael, for some people that feels like a recession. How would you describe it? I, I think that's 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 true. The, the property market, which has been a very important contributor to growth in China, has continued to languish, if not you know, get worse, as policy initiatives don't seem to be coming to the forefront as quickly as hoped for. Call it say at the beginning of the year, where everyone knew there was this problem in that in that sector, but it doesn't seem to have been dealt with from a point of view of getting it past the bottom of it and getting making progress going forward. So that will be it looks to be continued drag, if not. Um, indefinitely into the future. So growth is still likely to be you know, well below trend in China, considering that, as well as all the other factors. And also have to think about the Chinese currency. It has um, been tied to the dollar now pretty, pretty, pretty steadily for the last couple of months as the dollar has risen. It's rising on a trade-weighted basis as well. The question is, will the Chinese currency be able to hold its own if this continues in China? And so, Anne, final word goes to you. Just for the global equity market, looking at things regionally, geographically, so to speak, do you think the U.S. right now is just the least ugly story based on what's emerging elsewhere? I think it has been, Jonathan, um, but I do agree with Michael. If the dollar has peaked, and I think there's a good chance that it has, um, or it's close, then what has been a headwind for a lot of other countries will soon become a tailwind. And um, I, I think that could lead to much more attractive opportunities in emerging markets and other places. And Maletti, Michael Kushma, to the both of you, ahead of a big week ahead. Thanks for your time this morning. Coming up, the morning calls and later, Academy's Peter Chip joins us at the opening bell, making the case for Treasuries with markets underpricing the risk of recession. Why Peter Chip thinks that recession could be sooner and could be deeper. He joins us in about eight minutes' time from New York City this morning. Good morning. This is Bloomberg. Five minutes away from the opening bell here. Equities delivering a week of gains last week, a morning of gains so far. We're up by about a quarter of 1% on the S&P, on the Nasdaq up by a tenth of 1%. Let's see equity picture. Here's the bond market story. Last week, Thursday, Friday, two-year yields came in 25 basis points. The why? The data wasn't great. Really ugly PMI on Friday. On Thursday, jobless claims climbing in the wrong direction for the third straight week. Bit of a bounce this morning. Yields hard by five basis points on a two-year. Up nine basis points on a 10-year. You can see that curve steepness just starting to bounce back just a little bit this morning. That's the price action. Let's get you some morning calls. Morgan Stanley downgrading snap to underweight from overweight, expecting ad revenue to remain soft amid increasing competition and weakening demand. That sharpens the focus on Alphabet and on Facebook later this week. Next up, Susquehanna downgrading United Airlines to neutral, $35 price target, highlighting a challenging macro environment and continuing operational headwinds. And finally, Oppenheimer trimming its Amazon price target to 160 ahead of Thursday's results, expecting consumers to reduce their spending once the summer comes to an end. That's stock at 122.88 and up four tenths of 1%. That's three of the calls this morning. Up next, gearing up for a huge week of big tech results. Academy's Peter Cheer warning of a deeper and more painful recession than markets are currently pricing. We'll get Pete's thoughts on that and a whole lot more in about four minutes' time. With futures just about positive and fading a touch, we're up a quarter of 1%. This is Bloomberg. Twenty-four seconds away from the opening bow this morning. A brand new trading week just around the corner. Good morning. Futures positive two tenths of one percent on the S&P on the Nasdaq, basically unchanged on a small caps of Russell, up a third of one percent. From New York, your opening bow just about to ring. There you go. Switch up the board and get to the bond market. Ten-year yields look like this. Yields higher, nine basis points. The two point eight three. 0% on a 10-year. The curve just a little bit steeper here. Last week, two-year yields lower, much lower across Thursday and Friday. Downside surprise after downside surprise on the data front and a wrong kind of upside surprise on jobless claims. Pair that with PMIs and yields were heading south. They're heading north this morning. Euro dollar 
up a third of 1%, 102.48. We've talked about this growing tension between weaker economic data, think of German business confidence, against the more hawkish central bank. Think of an ECB policymaker this morning teeing up potentially another 50 basis point hike in September. Crude bouncing back up 1.6%, a 96 handle on WTI, $96 and about 20 cents. We're about 40 seconds into this with positive a tenth of 1%. Leading the way is energy off the back of that climb in crude. Energy up by 1.1%. Utilities a little bit more defensive. They underperform. We're down two tenths of 1% there. Joining us for a look at the stocks around the open and bow, some single name movers. Here's Kenny Greifout. Well, you left off with energy. That's where I'm going to start. It's pretty muted reaction to the opening bell. But if you look under the surface, you do have energy front and center. You can see ExxonMobil higher about by about 1% or so. You're also seeing some of the basic materials higher as well. That's good for some of the steel makers. Uh, we have Clifflin Cleaves highlighted there. That's up about 1%. If you move down the list, though, it's not as green. You have Twitter down by over 1% just a few minutes into trading. Of course, Twitter had a disappointing earnings report on Friday. They blamed Elon Musk. Elon Musk fired back saying, I'm rubber, they're glue on Twitter, it, the website. I haven't heard that one for a few decades. In any case, Twitter shares down by about 1.6%. And NVIDIA falling along with the other chip makers. You did see Intel sign a very big contract for its contract chip making R. That's good, bad news rather for the other chip makers. Uh, NVIDIA being front and center there. Can I just admit that I'd never heard of that particular saying? Really? I'm rubber there. Is that You've a never been is that, on an is, American playground? Is that an playground? American school thing? That is very popular in about middle school. It's your words bounce <laughs> off me and they stick to you. <laughs> exactly. I had to get someone to explain that to me over the weekend. There Katie, you go. Thank you. Appreciate it. Kind of graph out. Looking ahead to a big week ahead for tech earnings and maybe not the schoolyard insults. I, I'd never heard of that, but okay. Katie Lines joins us now. Big week ahead, Katie, for big tech. Yeah, huge week ahead across just the five tech names, Microsoft, Alphabet, Meta, Amazon, and Apple. We're talking a casual $7.5 trillion in market cap, or roughly 20% of the S&P 500. So this is a lot of weight that could have the power to move the broader market. Of course, it's Al Alphabet and Microsoft first out of the gate today. For Microsoft, as usual, we'll be paying attention to that Azure cloud business. With Alphabet, though, the focus really is going to be about online advertising on Google. Because if Snap is a reliable indicator, Companies are pulling back on that in a big way. In fact, according to some estimates out there, the U.S. digital ad market likely only increased about 11 percent in the second quarter. That is a steep deceleration from the 58 percent growth we saw in the year ago period. So that could impact not just Alphabet, but Meta as well. Meta is actually expected to post its first period of zero sales growth since the company's IPO about a decade ago. And for Alphabet, expected to see the slowest growth since the start of the pandemic in 2020. Meanwhile, Amazon is actually getting a larger share of its revenue from advertising as well, and it's expected to see the slowest revenue growth going all the way back to 2001, up just 6%, a dramatic cool down compared to the 30 to 40% growth we have seen throughout the pandemic. And of course, throughout the pandemic, they spent a lot of money investing in new warehouses in the labor force. It's looking now like they may have overdone that and profits going to take a hit as a result. We're expecting net income to be down about 82%. Now, of course, they're trying to pull back on their workforce. One of a string of companies that is looking at slowing or even uh, slowing hiring or even firing in some places. I expect we're going to hear a lot about that this week, John, in addition to foreign exchange and all of those other big themes we're following. Did you guys not have that line about sticks and stones may no, we break did. my bones? You had that too. Yes, but that was the more common one. I but hadn't heard of the rubber thing The rubber either. glue thing, uh, it didn't make it our way yeah, at all. No. It didn't make it down your way either <laughs> it did not. in Virginia. Okay, good to know. Katie, thank you. PIMCO Jerome Schneider on more serious things now, telling investors to build some dry powder in portfolios. The right thing to do at this point in time is actually position yourself for a little bit of patience in your portfolios and have those higher cash levels and perhaps take advantage of the higher relative rates that we're seeing in the front end uh, of, of global interest rates curves. Academy's Peter Cheer sounded the alarm on the economy. He writes this over the weekend. I am clearly in the camp that the recession risk is closer than we think and that it will be deeper and more painful than the market is currently pricing in. Pete, I'm pleased to say, joined us now because I like Pete, not because I want to read this anymore. Pete, I read this over the weekend. It was thoroughly depressing. Can you tell me why you think this is the case? You know, a lot of what you were just discussing really falls into this it is there was a lot of wealth created at these disruptive companies. Those individuals have lost a lot of wealth. But I think just as importantly, a lot of these disruptive companies, they were a huge engine for growth. They were advertising. They were buying chips. They were doing a lot of things because it was growth at all costs. 
And now that there's this fixation on revenue, I think you could see a slowdown from the spending from those people. I think you can see a slowdown from the spending of those companies. And that hasn't been factored in. That's a really new phenomenon. That huge wealth effect that we had that is dissipating very, very rapidly. That to me is what is going to turn what could be a garden variety recession and is going to make it hit us sooner and faster than anyone's currently thinking. Pete, what are you seeing in the data that supports that view? Are you seeing that yet at all? You know, we saw the PMIs come down. I think housing to me was one of the leading indicators, right? We wanted to fight housing, mortgage rates spiked. You're seeing nothing but bad data coming out of housing. And as PMIs come down, and you're starting to see anecdotally everywhere you look, hiring freezes, people laying people off, et cetera. So I think it's starting to show up there. And I think that's gonna be the big surprise is when within a month or two, all of a sudden we're like, oh, wow, this was worse than we thought, just like PMIs on Friday. Pete, that's the intended consequence perhaps of tighter Fed policy. Are you seeing any unintended consequences of tighter Fed policy? Yeah, I think, again, this goes back to, I think things have changed. One, we're way too dependent on finance and leverage and interest rates. So when they hike, it has a bigger impact. I think QE really did help inflate asset prices. QT is going to take that off. And then I do think they're just missing this recent wealth effect, whether it was crypto, these disruptive stocks, all great companies potentially, but there has been this wealth loss and I think that's really going to get this ball rolling and make everyone very cautious. And it's that accelerant that's the problem, that the Fed is not taking into account, I don't think, in a very good way, because I think they're relying on traditional models and not thinking maybe outside the box enough. So, Pete, you mentioned the our word. That's what I want to sit on just for a moment. We're often always thinking about where is the leverage? And what I've experienced over the last few weeks, in fact, the last 12 months, is someone again and again and again, people coming on this show, and basically saying that there isn't a problem with leverage. Consumer balance sheets are strong. Corporate balance sheets are strong. Where's the leverage, Pete? So I think corporate balance sheets are generally strong, but I think it was these growth companies, right, where you had growth with no you know, concern about earnings, right? That's been taken off. So I think that was a degree of leverage. And I'm not so sure about the consumers. I think you're starting to see some delinquency show up. It's still at very low rates, but in some of the payments, and many still have moratoriums on student loans, et cetera. I think as those things start coming off, that again, we're going to get see the shock effect. I think we already saw it once on the spending side where people had front-loaded spending. I think that's going to impact their credit, their willingness to spend going forward. So I think these are all really coming together, and unfortunately, it's going to come together probably this summer ahead of the elections. And Pete, you could make the case the bond market is picking up on it. Yields came in pretty aggressively on Thursday, on Friday at the front end. This market, do you think it should focus on just yields coming down, supportive of risk assets, or the why, the why of yields coming down? So to me, that's a big shift is for a while we got away with lower yields meant good for risk assets. And I think the two things that have changed were last year or so, lower yields were really a direct result of Fed policy. So there wasn't an economic reason necessarily, it was Fed policy. So now that yields are going down, but you can really tie it to economic concerns, I think you have to take cash flows down so those should balance themselves. Again, I'm very worried about this disruptive technology stock where you had this ability to rise through anything. If you ran out of money, you could get more money, whether it's Series B, Series C, SPAC, um, IPO. That's been cut off for a lot of these companies, right? You're seeing valuations come down. You're seeing um, a big divergence, I think, between where companies think they should be valued and where private equity wants to contribute more. And that, to me, is a form of leverage. So, Pete, tell me where you're bearish, much more so right now, because this equity market's rallied off the lows of June. Yeah. Credit spreads have tightened aggressively off the wides of June. Where are you most bearish? I'm probably most bearish, again, in this disruptive and big tech. I think they've had a really nice bounce. It was a great bounce. I think a lot of hedges got taken off. And I understand why we all want these to get back to where they were. It's, you know, they're appealing. There's great growth stories. I just think that that's where the excess keeps getting pumped in, and that's going to keep kind of getting deflated. So we go through this, we blow it up a bit, we deflate, and every time we kind of get to new lower lows. So that, to me, is where I'm most concerned. I'm pretty good on credit. In fact, I like senior quality credit. I like CLOs in particular at the senior tranches. I think rates are fine. We'll bounce around a little bit, but I think the highs of the year are certainly in. I buy yields. And I think we can take a little bit of a look at some of the commodity stocks because they've been beating up pretty hard. So really, to me, it's going to be this big tech disruptive that, again, I want to take some of the air out of this you know, recent rally. Pete, how do you think the policymaker is going to respond to the situation that you think will evolve, will materialize? You know, what I would like to see is them become really data dependent and really force home on Wednesday that they're concerned about recession, that they're worried about that. What I'm seeing, though, is I think um, Treasury Secretary Yellen just came out saying she doesn't see a recession. 
The White House just published a blog trying to redefine what a recession is. So that tells to me there's still political pressure leaning on this inflation, inflation, inflation. And I think they've gone too far on that. So I could get very, very bullish if the Fed makes it sound like they are really going to balance this recession risk. If they come in all in on inflation, ignoring recession risk, then I think it's another big leg down for stocks. It sounds like to me, though, Pete, that you think the forces have already been unleashed, that there's not much the Fed can pivot to, that it's too late. Would that be right? I think they still have a shot. You know, this week, if they really correct it, I think some of these forces have been moved. I, th I don't think we're bouncing back to the highs anytime soon, even if they act well. So they, but they have to start acting now. I think you go through this, you've got another month and a half or to the next meeting, and that's going to be too late. How do they pause, though, Pete, with inflation still close to nine, eight, seven, six? Even if we get to the end of the year and it's five or four, don't they have to keep on going? I don't think so. I think you're seeing commodity pressure ease. You're seeing some supply chain issues ease, and you're seeing consumer spending drop. So we've got to be forward looking, right? Plus, a bunch of the hikes that they've already done are only starting to work their way into the economy. Traditionally, we always thought it was three to six months. I think that's been accelerated. But I think they should give this a pause and see where things come out because I think they've been too, you know, telegraphed, too aggressive, and they are they were, they were so far behind the curve. Maybe they even missed the curve. So I, I ah. think they should really pause. And watch this data. Pete, we're all trying to trade the Fed pause. I know so many people are. Pete, one thing that hasn't come up at all, really, is when we look at lost decades, you can find them in the United States. You can find them on the NASDAQ. Of course, we're used to talking about them in Japan. Is there a risk here that even if the Fed pauses, Pete, that we could face the same situation in U.S. markets? And I only ask that because it's never asked. Pete, we always think about the Fed pausing. We're off to the races again. Here we go, another bull market. Is there a risk here that that could be the case? That we enter this new market regime that, sure, even if you get a Fed pause down the road, you don't go back to what we used to have? Yes, I, I agree with that. I think this kind of world of deglobalization or globalization is kind of ending. So I do think what we need to see real growth and real upside to the markets is this kind of reshoring. I think uh, Yellen called it friend shoring. We've been talking about the concept of working with countries. Um, that are closer to you. And we need to rebuild our supply chain. We need to become energy independent again, fully energy dependent, both on sustainable as well as traditional energy. And those would be the catalyst for growth. And I think that's what it takes for me to get really comfortable that we can, you know, avoid this sort of lost period of time. Otherwise, if we keep kind of getting lost in our own politics, not making good policy, not redeveloping our supply chains, I think we're going to kind of wobble around for a period of time. Pete, you're going to stick with us to work through some of the data we're going to get later this week. I want your thoughts on that GDP print this Thursday. Peter Cheer there of Academy Securities. Coming up, President Biden taking somewhat of a victory lap. Gas prices are coming down. In fact, gas prices have fallen every day this summer for 38 days in a row. That conversation up next. President Biden speaking on gasoline prices in a virtual meeting as he quarantines with COVID. Average prices at the pump have been falling every single day since his peak in the middle of June, still 32 percent higher than it was at the beginning of this year. Joining us now from D.C. is Anne-Marie. Hey, AMH. Hey, John. Yeah, the president is really wants to make sure that the public knows that prices are falling. If you look at his latest tweet on his Twitter handle, he does just that and he keeps updating it. And right now, what we do have is uh, gasoline prices hovering around $4.30. Gas Buddy actually says that prices across the nation are more closer to $3.99. So this is good for the president. Remember, this continues to come up in polls, that inflation is the biggest concern. And then one of those big reminders, of course, is gasoline prices. You see that every single day if you're American driving in a car or walking across a gas station. The issue, though, Jonathan, of course, are the risks that are attached to it. Can the prices continue to fall or stay at a relatively average level that they're that the president deems is acceptable ahead of the November midterm elections? And Marie, thank you. Mike McKee, ahead of the GDP print later this week. And we've already heard from Secretary Yellen over the weekend, Mike McKee, about whether they would or would not call that a recession. Mike, can you just frame what's going to happen this Thursday when we get that GDP number and how you think people are going to respond to it? 
Well, people are going to look at the uh, number and those who think we're in recession could make an argument because we're likely to get either a contraction or a gain that is so small we really don't know, uh, notice the difference. Uh, and then everybody's going to look to Friday and the prices. And the question is, does the Fed keep raising rates because prices keep going up and then push us into recession? One of the problems is we're not going to see the decline in gas prices make it into the PCE numbers this month because it all took place in July and it's going to take place into August. But you look at the, the, that uh, gas chart again and you can see mathematically inflation is going to go down because gas prices are going to go down. It also has a psychological effect, not just the political aspect that uh, AMH was talking about, but also the fact that people may feel like they can spend more money on other other things now if gas prices keep going down, which would contribute to GDP. Now, here's something interesting. We aren't going to see gas prices reflected in this, but take a look here. The uh, Philadelphia Fed and the New York Fed's latest indicators, the Philly Fed Index and the Empire Index, show that inflation, prices paid by companies, went down over the last month. And then that Michigan number, which sent the Fed to a 75 basis point the last time, has gone down. People think inflation is starting to fall back, and maybe that's because of gasoline prices. So there are some indications that maybe the Fed is doing enough on inflation, that it will come down, and they maybe don't need to run us into a recession. The question is, where is that point? Mike McKee, thank you. Looking ahead to the data this week and, of course, the Fed Wednesday and beyond. Looking at GDP on Thursday, the estimates so far for the second quarter, positive 0.4 percent off the back of a negative 1.6 percent. The consensus view is that we get a positive view. That's the median estimate. But there are some banks out there looking for a negative print. They include Bank of America, TD, Deutsche Bank, Nomura, all looking for that second straight quarter of negative growth. Peter Chu, I promise you we'd bring you back in to the conversation on this particular topic. Peter Chu, of course, from Academy. Pete, can you just walk me through how you'd respond to that as a market participant if we got that negative print this Thursday on GDP? So I'm not overly concerned about a negative GDP print. I think we might get one. But the first quarter, it was really inventory related and export related. So I'm, I'm not too worried about that. I'm going to be much more focused, I think, on the housing data. And really, for me, it's actually going to be earnings. I, I don't typically pay this much attention to earnings, but I want to hear what these big tech companies have to say. Are they still seeing that spending? Because I think that is going to what drives us for the next two to three months, not what happened the prior two months. So I think that's big. I do think this fixation on a few cents here and there on gasoline prices has just become almost insane. And we've got to be thinking about the bigger picture. I think the average consumer is much more aware of everything that's going on. And I think this housing price, if that starts coming down, we see weakness there. That's yet another reason actually for consumers not to spend, right? I believe that 60% of American households own their home. I'm much more afraid as they've kind of deflated that to the point that that starts impacting than a few cents here or there on gasoline. So I think politicians directing the economy fixated on one metric is a recipe for disaster ultimately and leads us to the wrong conclusions. And Pete, from what I heard this morning about driving and the demand season, it's meant to be peaking here summer driving season in America. From what I heard about that this morning, it's because prices are so high that people have stepped back. So that's already having the impact and that's perhaps why Prices have been coming down. Pete, I'd love your view on tech. You mentioned it briefly. Which names, where specifically, and what spending? Is it cloud spending, ad spending? What is it? I think I just keep looking at what were these disruptive companies doing? What did they need? They needed semiconductors. They needed web services. They needed all these things. And they were able to spend pretty aggressively because they did not have to worry about the next round of cash flow. If that's what I want to see, are, is that now following up into the bigger companies who are selling that? into those disruptive companies. So that, to me, is going to be the triggering point, I think. Peter Chair of Academy Securities. Pete, great note this weekend. Even though it was very bearish, I enjoyed reading it, as always. Great work, Pete. Just awesome. Looking ahead to a big week ahead. Big morning for some people over at Morgan Stanley. Let's get you some breaking news. Here's Shanali Basak. Hey, Shanali. Hey, John. You have a big move over at Morgan Stanley. That's the co-head of equities trading departing. That is David Russell, who has been at the bank for nearly three decades. Remember, Alan Thomas and Goka Larea are still at the bank. They are overseeing this business. Morgan Stanley is the biggest equities trading shop on Wall Street. In recent quarters, remember, however, John, Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan have won a lot of share. And in some quarters, they're actually even coming in above 
Morgan Stanley in that business. So there's a lot of pressure on this team. There have been a lot of changes internally within the equities division. This has been a Morgan Stanley lifer, essentially. Uh, in the memo that Bloomberg Sridhar Natarajan had picked up from Ted Pick, who oversees the total business, uh, they had really said he's worn the Morgan Stanley blue jersey for, for all of that time. But uh, eyes now are on Goka Laroya and Alan Thomas, who will be co uh, leading this business, who were elevated in 2018 alongside David Russell to run this business uh, and are just facing a very competitive time ahead. Shanali, looking forward to your coverage of this developing story this morning. Shanali Basak there, our chief Wall Street correspondent. Coming up, your trading diary. What a week ahead we've got for you. Coming up to 26 minutes into the session, just about positive on the S&P 500 here. It's a mixed session. We're down about two-tenths of one percent on the Nasdaq. Big week ahead for the Nasdaq. Here's your trading diary on the week ahead. You'll hear from the president twice today. First at 12.30 Eastern, then again at 2.15 this afternoon. Big tech earnings kicking off with Alphabet and Microsoft on Tuesday. A Fed rate decision and Chairman Powell News Conference Wednesday. U.S. GDP and jobless claims on Thursday, followed by earnings from Apple and Amazon. And we round out the week with PCE, the ECI. University of Michigan Consumer Sentiment and all of the above. From New York, thank you for choosing Bloomberg TV. Looking forward to the week ahead and covering that with you. This was the countdown to the open. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.